So, ladies uh, and gentlemen, and uh, wherever you may be across the globe listening and watching this uh, this broadcast this morning, welcome to another Saturday morning edition uh, of Tigers and Teddies. This morning, we're looking at the power of language and getting rid of jargon. Uh, the hashtag, if you are joining in the debate on Twitter, is hashtag Tigers and Teddies. And uh, please use the chat facility as we go through the morning. So, as always, let me start by saying hello to uh, the uh, the the author of this wonderful book, Saber Tooth Tigers and Teddy Bears: The Connected Baby Guide to Attachment. Dr. Suzanne Zedike, good morning to you. How are you this morning? Good morning, Gary. I'm here with my Teddy. It's lovely to welcome everyone back, and um, it will be really interesting to talk today about whether Teddies are too light away to talk about science and the way that we translate to the public. So I'm delighted to have you all back. Good morning, everybody. Good. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, I've got my Dermot there with me constantly now ever since we started this series. Uh, so he's, uh, he's, he's never, uh, never far away from my side. So it's good to see you, Suzanne. I think it's going to be a lively debate this morning. Um, some of the language may be a little bit more robust than we're used to, uh, but that's all going to be part of the, the debate. And we're talking about language and we're talking about getting rid of jargon, which takes me very nicely to our very special guest this morning. Um, our very special guest this morning is psychologist Dr. Jess Taylor. Uh, she is the founder of Victim Focus. She is an author. She is a podcast host or a co-host uh, of her new podcast, uh, which was just out this week, I believe, uh, The Wandering uh, Womb, which we'll talk about as well. And she is a leading voice in feminist thinking in the UK. Dr. Jess Taylor, good morning to you. Morning. Thanks for having me. Jess, it's great. I've got to say there's been a lot of anticipation uh, about you being on the, uh, on the show uh, because uh, you have a, a, a vast following on your social media uh, network. You're obviously with the author uh, and with, with Victim Focus. But before we talk about any of that and then we share the conversation with you and Suzanne, Jess, tell me, tell me a little bit about yourself for people who may be uh, new to you and your work. Um, okay, so um, I am Dr. Jessica Taylor. I am a psychologist. I have a PhD in forensic psychology. I specialize in the psychology of victim blaming and self blame, um, specifically of women and girls subjected to male violence. I'm a radical feminist. I believe that women and girls are oppressed globally by the patriarchy and by male violence, and that we need to discuss the impact that has on trauma and on systems and on equality and things like that. Um, I love writing, so I write a blog. Um, my blog has 1.3 million readers a year, which is just insane. Um, I have written five or six books now, and they tend to have been successful. They seem to be helping people. And I have an ethos um, that is, you know, challenge the status quo, be critical, always use critical thinking, and to communicate as clearly as possible um, I don't necessarily have a lot of interest in academia. Um, in, and what I mean by that is that um, for me, going out and getting qualifications, getting a PhD was like a means to an end so that I could go back out into the general public. I wasn't interested in remaining you know, in academia as a lecturer or a professor or whatever. So um, yeah, it's, I'm a bit like a uh, Marmite really. Like some people genuinely like get it and they're like, ah, oh, yeah, I'll, like we'll listen to her because she's making everything accessible i make a lot of my stuff free um i do a lot of stuff that is you know as easy to understand and follow as possible so that we can share you know like interesting information without people feeling overwhelmed by it and then other people are not so happy about that so we'll talk about that as we go on i think <laughs> we, we will indeed jess what, what led you into the world of work that you're doing at the moment what motivated you to do this um, well, initially, like if you go back far enough, because I've been doing it nearly 11 years now, I actually wanted to be a neuropsychologist and that was because I had a stroke when I was 19 and I was just obsessed with like brain plasticity and, and how I'd recovered from this stroke and stuff. Um, and, um, I wanted to be a neuropsych and so I decided to um, study for a, a degree in psychology so I could go and do a PhD in neuropsychology um, but whilst I was doing my degree in psychology I decided that I wanted to volunteer my time somewhere uh, because I had this spare time on a Friday and so um, 
I went down to my local volunteer center and I was like, I've got a Friday free. What is there? I, I'll do anything. Like I just wanted to give some time to the community. And they were like, well, there's not really much, but there is this position at this thing called victim support where you support victims of crime. And I was like, Oh, I've never done anything like that. And like, I've been a victim of crime and I thought I could maybe do that. Um, and so I sort of got into forensics and crime by accident in a way. And I, I remember being in it and still thinking um, like, oh, I'm glad I'm giving my time, but I'm going to be a neuroscientist. I'm going to be a neuropsychologist. But then the more time I spent in that forensic field, the more I realized that there were serious problems, like real serious issues that weren't being addressed. They were being glossed over. Victims were being blamed. The system wasn't working. And it just made it just I, just every single day. I just kept thinking that doesn't work. That needs more research. That's not true. You know, that's harmful. Um, and so during the degree, I then started to become more and more interested in crime. And then um, from the volunteer position, I got offered a job at the court. And then I was doing that for a while. And then there was this big job came up as the area manager in the criminal justice system, um, looking after the vulnerable intimidated witness program. And I was like 20 or 21 and I just thought, fuck it, I'll just apply and just see what happens. And I'm very much like that. That's sort of who I am. It's like in for a penny and for a pound. I like just go for it and see what happens. And I got that job. And so I took over the Vulnerable Intimidated Witness Programme for Staffordshire um, when I was 21, I think, um, and had about 50 staff and I had five courts and took over homicides, trafficking, sexual offences, manslaughter. Uh, child abuse cases things like that um and then I was like really immersed in crime at that point and rather than me sorry that's our dog um rather than being interested in um the offenders which I'm not sorry she's not part of it. um one of the things like a lot of people in my field are interested in offenders and offender psychology I've never it, I do read about it and I know a lot about it and I spend a lot of time with offender psychologists but my interest is victims like I want, I want to make it better for victims of crime. I think that the service they get is shit. I think that the, we don't understand trauma. We're not supporting them. So that was when I decided, right, I'm going to do a PhD to try and figure out what our issue is with victims. Because every day, day in, day out, all I saw was people discrediting victims, even little children being told, you're lying, you're making it up, you're exaggerating, you're doing it maliciously, you know, that blaming them for being raped, blaming them for being abused, blaming them for being neglected. And it, every day I went into work and watched it happen over and over and over again and that, that was when I decided I'm going to do something about this um I worked after that I took over a rape center um and I retrained about 30 um rape therapists and counselors and um I retrained them from sort of a trauma-informed position and from a anti-victim blaming position anti-pathologization position which is quite controversial. Um, and then I went into working with trafficked children, sexually exploited children, and started writing national materials and stuff like that to try and change the conversation. Um, yeah, and then that takes us up to like when I was about 26, 27, I think, maybe, t no, 26, and uh, maybe 27. And then I was, I found myself getting in more and more trouble. Like I was in trouble all the time. Like every time I was questioning something, somebody would be like, Jess, you need to calm that down. You need to tone it down. You need to not say that. You can't say that on Twitter. You can't say that to the local authority. You're not allowed to say that to the police force. And I just was like, why? Because what they're doing is wrong and the way they treat victims is wrong. So I don't really care about your politics. And that was when I remember I was like, I had some annual leave over Christmas one year and I just thought, I'm just going to set up my own business. I'm just going to do this on my own because I need to be able to push practice. I need to be able to criticize. I need to be able to write things and challenge things. And I do not need somebody talking to me about bullshit work politics, but oh, you can't say that because you'll offend that person. And you know, so that's how victim focus was born. It was like, I'm going to build something myself that can be challenging and critical and where I can't get a P45. That was, <laughs> Literally, <yeah. laughs> you know i i think um you certainly have uh changed the the course of the conversation but you know what jess i'm sure that um it's not been easy how have you how have you coped with the 
with the with the detractors. Uh, I mean, I read a, an article uh, in in the Guardian um, where it, it talked about um, you know getting a lot of stick from 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 lots of people, misogynists, the whole thing. How, how have you coped with with all that in the grand scheme of things? Does it does it does it does it do you, is it like water off a duck's back, or or what, how does it affect you? Some of it is, some of it don't bother me at all. And I just like, I, I, some of it, I will literally receive a tweet or a comment and I'll just think, oh, dickhead, and just like ignore it. Um, and then it's, it, it's, to be honest with you, it's more, th- there are particular things that still bother me. And I think it would be a lie to pretend it doesn't. I don't like it when people make out that, like, oh, it just don't bother me. Like, don't lie. Like, you're a human being. Um, you know, there's been times where I've been sent hundreds and or even thousands of abusive or threatening messages, you know. You can't pretend that that doesn't impact you. Like, so I think for me, it's on like different levels. So if, some, if people are just being a bit shitty, that doesn't bother me at all. If people are just sending me anonymous abuse, that doesn't bother me at all. It's when it's like personal or if it's like, and that's why um, even though people, this is a hard way to explain it, but people feel like they know me and that they know a lot about me, but I actually keep a lot of my life off social media. I don't talk about my kids. I don't talk about our personal life. I don't ever share photos and other and like things like that. And that's to protect the, my family as much as possible. Um, just because of the violence towards me a lot of the time. So the death threats and rape threats, and then I have my computer hacked and, um, you know, I've had all sorts of things. I've been protested and no platformed and all sorts of things. But um, yeah, it's mainly some of it's very violent and like it's shocking. Like so, I a couple like last month or no, the month before, I got an extremely graphic death threat, which was like how this guy was gonna like kill me and then mutilate my body and then what he was going to do to it and stuff and it was like really really graphic and it was just like whoa like I was eating my dinner when I got it and I was like fuck like and I had to like take a break and then send it to the police um and then there's been some like really sexual stuff like really disgusting sexual stuff um there's a lot of like homophobia and then there's a lot of like mis- just general misogyny that you get anyway and then there's the anti-feminist type stuff and then the EDL hate me as well because I like basically aren't a racist. So that basically that they just I make them mad for some reason. Um, so there's like there's lots of different groups that have an issue with what I'm doing for lots of different reasons. And then on top of that, you get like just the sort of snarky shit from other academics, which I'm just not really used. I, I don't really know what that's about because you would think, wouldn't you, that other educated people that claim to be in the field to be doing something positive would just talk to you and be like, oh, me and you have different opinions on this. Um, and I just thought, like, we could talk about it. <laughs> but they're, sometimes they're as bad as the trolls. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been a bit of a shock. <laughs> it's a, it's it's a it's a really uh, interesting life that you, you you appear to have, and I've only just really scratched the surface, Jess, on uh, in terms of doing my research. I'll hand over to to Suzanne in just a second. Um, the 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 Wandering Womb podcast uh, is something that you launched very very recently uh, and had what seven hundred and fifty five downloads in the first day. Just tell us a little bit about that because I want people to dig this out and it is still it's out there and it's on all all the platforms tell us a little bit more about that and then we'll go to go to Suzanne um okay it's, it is exciting isn't it so um me and my partner Jamie we decided to um set this podcast up just because whenever we do whenever I do Facebook live events with all my Facebook followers or when I do like stuff that people can just interact and have a chat with us there was often people making comments being like like, cause me, like, just because of the way me and Jamie communicate with each other and the way that we talk, people were saying, you need a show, or you need this, or you need to make videos, or you need, like, whatever it was. And we'd, like, talked about it, like, almost like having a laugh for a bit, and me and, me and her were like, yeah, maybe we should do that. Yeah, maybe, like, that would be funny, wouldn't it? And then, and then we just decided, I think we should just do it, like, not even rehearse it, not even think about it at all. So the this is as simple as it was right the other night we were drinking and we were like let's just record a fucking podcast like while we're having a drink and we were like that's a great idea and like it could be an awful idea but we'll just see how that goes 
So um, we decided um, to call it the Wandering Womb podcast after like two glasses of wine or three glasses of wine or something. And then we just set it up. Like the software is so easy these days to do something like that. And I already had an account because I have another podcast that I use um, for academic and like professional type education that's called um, Dr. Jessica Taylor talks about every, talks about stuff or something like that. Um, and that's aimed at practitioners that work with children. So then I already had this platform, so it was easy to do. So we decided to set this podcast up and we got the mics out. And then we had been talking about it for a few weeks about all the different topics we would want to cover. And then we just decided that we would just sit, have a drink and have just a natural chat about whatever the topic is for that week. And we'll just release one a week. Um, And that they'll be funny and honest and like tackling issues that need to be talked about. But in our way of doing it because Jamie comes from like Jamie has um her you know education in international relations and political science and things like that she's done a lot in politics um and then she has all of her interest in radical feminism and then she like has all these different sort of areas of interest and a lot of what we do overlaps but also we have we often have very different views on things as well and we also have very similar views on things and we just thought that that would be fun and make a podcast so we did and then we released it and it's just been really successful and people have just loved it and we keep getting messages from people being like i've been listening to the podcast while i walk my dog and just like laughing into like just the park it's brilliant um, I, I'm, I'm not going to spoil it for people uh, I, I, I love the <laughs> format it's very very different and uh yeah so so you you've got to download it and and you've got to listen um suzanne uh, my question to you is going to be why did you want jess on this series involved in this series but i think just listening to jess for the past 10 minutes has answered that but let me ask you the question anyway so what why why uh, why jess uh, in in the series Gary, thank you. I'm incredibly excited to have Jess here today because as everybody will already have experienced, Jess is really real and really authentic and talks about authenticity and is authentic in the way that she talks about the the topic she's interested in. So we need talking about authenticity and we need deep thinking. So Jess doesn't hold back in what she thinks and therefore creates debate, and I think that pushes us to think. So, for instance, I've had folks who tweeted, as I said Jess was coming on today. So this came from Graham, who I think is with us today. So in other words, a guy. And that is one of the elements in all of this is gender. How does that intersect with the things that we're trying to talk about, especially with trauma, especially with relationships, raising babies, all of that has a gendered aspect to it. Okay, so Graham has said, learning without the bullshit is why I like Jess. It's her straight talking. She's right to the point. Okay. From Canada, we had come in, making knowledge accessible. Everyone deserves to know this, not just the intellectual and professional elite with the hashtag tear down the ivory tower. Okay, so one of the reasons I'm excited to have Jess here is That is hard for academics to hear. Mm. Everybody knows that in um, who follows my work knows that I was an academic for 20 years and I stepped away from academia because I found it hard to reach the public. And what I wanted to do is to translate the science that I thought was incredibly exciting and really useful and that people deserve to know. I wanted to find a way to reach the public with that. So I did a version of what Jess did, but Jess did it much earlier and from the outset. I spent, you know, 20 years in an academic setting in order to try to find new words, new ways, new formats to try to help people to understand the science of attachment. Okay, so here's another reason then that I'm excited that Jess is here. Jess actually takes a different view than me on some of this stuff. Okay, and some of you know I use the word stuff to try to decrease the anxiety that lots of people feel about science. Um, but the, so if we talk about adverse childhood experiences, Jess isn't a supporter of that. And we can come back to that in a minute. So some of you may be, I know lots of you who are here this morning will um, have found um, a lot of insights and benefit from adverse childhood experiences. And I know that I have come to be seen as a, um, 
um, su supporter, if that is the right word, of that frame. Jess isn't. Okay, we need debate. And the tone of the debate is really important. And there are power issues in all of that. So that's why from Canada, and that'll be Liz Perry. Liz Perry in Canada thinks that ACES has been helpful to her understanding, but she is, um, she thinks that there is a power dimension about academics holding on to that information and it doesn't get translated. So another reason I'm excited about Jess being here is because she makes us think how we translate that information. And one of the um, women have often not, um, start that again as I can feel the anger in me rise, women have of, often just suffered from the way that trauma is talked about. It's been totally misunderstood. Jess can talk about a whole lot more about this. <clears throat> so Jess talks about it in 2020. It's really, um, it takes me back 20 years that I published this book in 2000, which is trying to talk about the same things that Jess is trying to talk about now, but it was done in a really academic fashion. But it was talking about the way in which um, the law constructs women's experiences in a particular way that works against them. Jess is trying to help us to understand that today. And so it, for, for me, it's a, um, it is part of the history of my work, but lots of people wouldn't have known me as a feminist. Okay, so I'm excited that we can do this kind of debate and how we look at specifically issues like, where does the power lie? Who gets to decide how we frame experience, the language that we put to it, what happens when groups are excluded from that? And Jess is excellent at, at, at highlighting all of that because she does it with no holes bar. Now, let me say one other thing that was that was the uh, key reason that I thought, I know who I want on this, I want Jessica Taylor. In this book, Tigers and Petties, I have had colleagues say to me that they're not sure that we should talk about science with something as light, a metaphor, as teddy bears. And so they're uncomfortable that I have taken scientific information and tried to find ways to talk to the public about it. And so, it makes it sound light. And the question is, does it? Because if it is light, Jess is talking, the things Jess talks about, she's just told us she gets death threats for. Attachment goes back 75 years. I think it's really useful to the public. I think it's useful to parents, but it hasn't been as useful as it could have been. And some of that is, I think, the way that it's talked about and the way in which it was used in policy because it talks, you know, it's referring to the relationships between mothers and babies. Are we talking parents? There are whole debates and all of that. So Jess updates that what has been around for a long time that I think could be useful and hasn't reached people in the way that it could have. So I am super excited to have Jess here because there's a debate to be had and she helps us to see things that lots of people have not um, perhaps discern some of those themes like language and power. So Jess, if that's a bit of fanning, there you go. <laughs> no pressure then, fucking hell. <laughs> Jess, you know, what is, what is this, this academic hesitancy, do you think, that, that, you know, that some academics have, that they don't almost want to share this information, share these messages in a very plain and simple way? style that people like me and people on the street can understand uh, why 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 does that happen do you think and why why do you get criticism for uh, for talking about complex subjects in such a simple understandable way to me it just doesn't make sense but but what have you got a theory on that um i think some of its power um in the you know some of us uh, does this thing that, that like this them and us um, dynamic that like we're supposed to be the experts and they're, and they're supposed to be the lay people which I hate um, and therefore you know those of us with a title or those of us with some sort of academic whatever credentials um, are supposed to be like 
more important or should use language that makes us sound more intelligent like for example when i was writing my phd uh, thesis and it was getting ready to be submitted i um wrote it in like you could literally download my thesis today and you will understand every single word of it because i deliberately wrote it even my phd thesis in a non-academic way and um that even that drew questions people were like why are you doing that like what's the point and i was like well why would you write anything that is hard to read even now i can download research journals articles from top journals that have been peer reviewed that have had three or four academics go wow this is amazing put it in and i don't understand a fucking word like i can sit and read it and think i can read two sentences and then go back and read two sentences again and then and then read them again and then come back and think why have they just put a load of massive words in there that i don't understand and they, they've made a sentence that could have been very simple. They've whacked it. It's like they got a fucking thesaurus out and was like, oh, I'll just swap it in for all these hard synonyms and we'll just put in some hard words and make myself sound more intelligent than I am. For me, that just makes everything inaccessible. There's no point to that. But I was definitely, there was definitely like an expectation that my work was supposed to sound more clever. And I don't really... I, I hate that. I really hate that. I don't want it to sound like that. I want it to be accessible. I want it to be easy to read because the the, the topics that we need to talk about are complex enough as it is. So I don't I don't particularly understand you know why the language also needs to be complicated. So my uh, my suggestions would be that it's a power dynamic thing. It's a very traditional power dynamic thing. Education has always been in the realms of the elite for a long period of time, and that's not going away anytime soon. So having people and it's not just me there's lots of people that try to communicate education in a really accessible way it, it starts to break down the them and us it starts to break down the power dynamic and it means that anybody can get access to very um, complex pieces of information and it educates them and therefore empowers them but it also means that it gives them a much more critical lens to look at the world and there are obviously you know arguments that people don't want that for the working class people don't want that for people so like for me i didn't know that was what i was doing i grew up in a poor area on a council estate from working class background that nobody had been to university nobody had even finished high school and um everybody i knew was exactly the same everybody talks like me and i didn't know i say this a lot of the time like when you grow up in an area like that, you don't know that you're poor. You don't know you're working class. You don't know there are other people that are talking better than you or whatever. You see posh people on the TV and you see like people with these like posh accents and stuff and you just assume that it's just like a whole different world to you and that you're just excluded from it. You don't connect with any of it. I didn't realise quite how different I was until I started doing the PhD and until I was in academia. And it was like my accent was a constant trigger for people, the way that I looked, the way that I act, my behavior, the swearing, the tattoos. And, it, and that was when I was like, whoa, I'm like really fucking different. And I didn't know what, I didn't realize that I was. Because we're fed the myth that like, if you just get educated, then you'll also be the same as them. You'll be the elite as well. The more education you get, you'll be, you can work really hard and then you can be one of them. It's not true because you'll still have all these life experiences from poverty or from working class backgrounds or from a non-elite background and that stays with you forever um so i think i make people uncomfortable also because i'm young and female and i'm i still sound exactly the same way as i always have and i you know i like don't pronounce things properly and i don't um you know i don't pander to people i have a real issue with this almost like expected respect like, like one of the things that i struggled with that plays into this and why i got criticized a lot was that i couldn't understand the hierarchy of academia like so for example why did i have to bow down to that particular professor who's never fucking looked at me twice because that person doesn't respect me so am i supposed to just respect them because they have professor in the title i don't know who the fuck they are they're nobody to me <clears throat> so I, I really struggled with some of that. I also struggled with the expectation that you're supposed to put the name of other people on your work as like a respect thing. And I, and I had an argument about it when I was doing my PhD 
where I turned around and said no. And the university was horrified and they were like, you have to because they're the you know top professor in the department. I was like, I don't give a shit. They didn't write a word of it. The name's not going on it. I, I, it's my work. I wrote it. I thought it. I did all the work. The name's not going on it. And they were like, you can't do that. I was like, yeah, I can. And it, it was like, there was a lot of like cultural differences between us where I was sort of saying, it's my work and therefore it's my name. And if they do some work towards it, they can have their name on it. And if they don't, they can fuck off. And that's the end of that argument. And I didn't understand like why like, there was so much etiquette in academia that I didn't understand. And that feeds into this as well. Is it, it's almost like supposed to be this like sort of elite gate like it's almost like a kept community and I, I do struggle then you've got all the racism in there the fact that a lot of these people are white middle class their parents are academics and professionals <sighs> it's the first time I'd ever experienced true classism because it's hard to experience classism when you're surrounded by the same social class as you you sometimes get it but you don't figure out what it feels like but then when you're placed into a whole other environment that's when you start to notice classism um, and misogyny as well and like it's you can those institutions they just feel very insecure i think sometimes like that they're not ready for education to truly be rolled out to everybody and information to be truly rolled out to everybody and that's one of the reasons why i also reject paywalled articles so you'll know some people who follow me will will be um thinking why why is jess never published her stuff in top journals it must be because she's a shit researcher no it's not it's because i'm not putting them in there I, if I, I get, I get emails every single, I got one while we were getting ready for the show. I got an email asking me to be an editor of a top journal. No, fuck off. Because the, the, why, right? So people aren't thinking about the grooming that goes into convincing academics that their stuff should be in these top paywall journals so the public can't read it. I would rather peer review my stuff through other people, through other academics, and then release it for free, which is why it's all free on my website. And it's all peer-reviewed research it's exactly the same as what you would have got in the journal it's no different but i've put it out for free and academics are led into this weird belief that your work is only worth something if it's in this top fucking journal which 49 pound 95 to read it for 24 hours and if you look up things like um there's this amazing documentary called i'm pretty sure it's called paywall and it's about the entire process of convincing academics and students that they should submit their work for free to a journal who then sells your work for the rest of your life and you receive zero so they are exploiting you and then journals like sage taylor and francis um and all the different big journals they're they're making billions a year it's a billion dollar industry right and the academics get nothing the editors get nothing the students get nothing they are selling your work over and over again to every university in the world and then you're told oh isn't that nice because your work's in a top journal like kudos to you like fuck off that's exploitation so yes like, all of it feeds into it doesn't it jess you have just demonstrated to people why i wanted to have you on today okay <laughs> what 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 so everybody will now be clear that what jess is trying to talk about are the power structures in how knowledge is created and in who gets to who gets to use it and who gets to understand it and who gets to frame the nature our understanding of the nature of human experience and human behavior that's what jess's really strong strident tone helps us to think about it. she pushes us into thinking about it and I, the, I, I'm watching the comments coming in. Lots of you are going, yay, Jess. We also heard the stories of the people who don't like this. Okay, I think we need to think about that much more deeply. And people pay prices when they don't even, when they're not even able to understand what is happening to them. So they can't, they can't find a language to talk about it. They can't then, um, they don't know where to start to make change. They just end up disempowered. Mm -hmm. And power structures are involved in all creation of knowledge. That sounds obvious if you've thought about it, but lots of people have never had a chance to think about that. And 
attachment, because those of you who come following my work will know that I frame it through the word attachment because that's the word Bowlby gave it. I don't actually think it was a very good word. I think he was doing his best at the time, but I wish he hadn't called it that. Not everybody is in favor of uh, his work. In the 1950s, um, his work was used to uh, get women back into the home mm -hmm. and, and therefore was used for, um, for cultural ends that didn't serve women. So should I be talking about attachment today? Should I be using that language? Should I be, um, should I be drawing on words today that may have had a shifted meaning, but that I still think are useful? That's been a big debate within the feminist literature. Lots of people don't know that there's a feminist critique of, of the science of child development often because there's not time to talk about it. And when people employ me to come in, so people will pay me to come and do training with their organization. There's never time to talk about their critiques. There's never time to talk about this, how knowledge gets constructed and the language that gets used. And yet I think it is as important a part of our understanding and thinking about how to make sense of human experience and behavior as all the rest of it. But it's, it's not, what um it's not what a lot of people want to talk about and just you spend so much of your time trying to help people to look at exactly that so some people are saying your piece recently on grooming where you said uncomfortable things like um, grooming happens all the time to expect women and girls to identify when they have been groomed is not reasonable and not fair because mm -hmm. professionals groom families to do the things that they want within their system as well. And it makes you take a deep breath and go, oh, I don't do that. Except we do. When you put a different frame on language, you see it in a new way. So maybe you want to tell people about your work on grooming, Jasper, who hasn't read that piece. Yeah. Okay. I will. Although it did piss the world off. So, um, see the tell thing is, <laughs> <laughs> um it was it, like it, it's something that because I've, obviously i've been working in abuse and violence for over a decade you know grooming is broader than sex offenses and the pro that my personal opinion and why i wrote the blog the other week is that by repeatedly defining grooming as something that only happens in sex offenses um, you, what you do is you miss the broader use of grooming and human manipulation that you are groomed all the time. You're groomed by marketing, you're groomed by fashion, you're groomed, uh, you know, by your parents, you're groomed in school. Like there are, like, and people don't like that sort of um, equivalency that I'm saying, actually, all humans are capable of grooming. You've all probably groomed somebody and everybody you are, li you are likely to have been groomed repeatedly. Um, there are lots of human behaviours that you do only because you've been groomed. And the example that I give in the blog is things like, think about how many unnatural, weird behaviours you were groomed into doing at school that have no benefit to you whatsoever. So, for example, you start school and you're all wearing exactly the same clothes for, you know, in, in the UK for no reason at all other than, than to make you all look the same. You um, respond to bells. So when bells go, you move you to different classes or you go for break or you eat on the bell. And then when the bell rings again, you don't eat. Or like you sit with your legs crossed on the floor for no real reason. You put your finger on your lips and you sit like this because that means that you're being good. Or like all of these things, they don't, they're not required. Like you don't have to put your hand up to speak. You don't have to put your finger on your lips. You don't have to sit with your legs crossed. These are all behaviors that are parts of grooming through reinforcement and through behavioral concepts and things like that, right? And we do this all of the time. So if you think you're groomed constantly all of the time to behave in a particular way by society, you're groomed into your gender role stereotypes, you're groomed into heterosexuality, you're groomed into a sexualization, you're groomed into like everything all the time. There is a, there is a very strong um, current in, in like trying to pull humans into all thinking and acting in one way, especially in like capitalism. We're groomed into capitalism, we're groomed into consumerism. And so 
what I was trying to get at in that article is that when you are then groomed for sexual abuse or domestic abuse, why in the fuck would you notice? Why would you notice the same tactics if you're already being manipulated and you're already being groomed by so many different arenas of life? When uh, an abuser, when a paedophile, when a sex offender, when you know a, an abusive partner in domestic abuse, when somebody starts to groom you and starts to manipulate you, coerce you, blackmail you, gaslight you, guilt trip you, all of those different tactics that they, they could potentially use, why would you notice? Why are you suddenly? Why do you suddenly have to be an expert on grooming? Why are you expected by society to spot a sex offender or spot a child abuser? Why are you supposed to know? Because you've been groomed by all these different um, roots for so long that when you're then groomed because somebody is going to abuse you, rape you, you know, traffic you or whatever, it, I just think it's so fucking insulting to then turn around to the to those children or to that woman or to that man and go, well, you should have known, you should have spotted the signs of grooming. Why didn't you know? And that, and that now as these professionals, they're going to go, oh, we're going to teach you to spot the signs of grooming. Fuck off. Not even professionals can spot the signs of grooming. I don't know a single professional that can spot a sex offender. I don't know a copper that can do it. It's just It's just a myth. And actually, as I was saying in the article, professionals have the same um, statistical chance of being abused as the general public. So these professionals who go, oh, we can teach you the signs of grooming and we can do this and we can do that, they're just as likely to be in an abusive relationship as the people who they're working with. So they're obviously not the experts that they claim to be. And that's another one of those like elitist power dynamics, isn't it? Um, yep. So yeah, I got myself in a whole host of shit for that. So. What I hope will happen is that m more people will feel empowered to, to think more about how knowledge is constructed, about who holds power in that, about how we frame the way we understand human behavior and who, who gets to decide that and who doesn't because all of that is based within power structures. And so Jess, do you, do you also wanna tell people because there's lots of people here whose lives have been, um, I think, they, they have said in, in the chat here and also on social media mm -hmm. that I know feel that understanding ACEs has helped their understanding of themselves. But Jess, you're not a supporter of that frame. And the reason that I'm opening that up is because I think debates are important. I, I think it, I want people to think beyond what they are presented with. The tone of the deb debate will make that more possible or will shut that down. And one of the big debates that we're having, lots of people at the moment, is a debate over ACEs. And so it, there are lots of people who feel like that's helped. And there are lots of people who feel much more uncomfortable about that. And you are one of the people who feels uncomfortable about that. So since we've got lots of people here, will you tell them why you don't like that way of constructing human experience? Um, yeah, sure. So I've written a couple of blogs about this. It's on um, the Victim Focus blog. So if you go, if you want to read it in more detail, like my position on it, then you can. It's, it's on there. Um, the re I am critical of ACEs. And I'm not critical of the concept of childhood trauma and the way that it impacts us. I'm not critical of that. Or I'm critical of the concept of ACEs because it's, on, it's based on shitty science. Um, and it's being used as a framework to score humans out of 10 which is a deficit model and I don't support deficit model working. So what I mean by that is um, if you know, if you're watching this and you've, you've sort of learned about ACEs, you'll know that people have a so-called ACEs score out of 10. And like you, you know, if you've experienced this, this and this, and you get a three, if you've experienced this, this, this and this, you get a five, whatever. And then based on that, there are, you know, these papers that argue that if your AC score is above four or above six, then you have more likelihood of this happening to you, of this trauma response, of this mental health issue, of suicide, of self-harm and all this shit. The reason that I don't like it is because it's based, first of all, you can't numerically value trauma. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that, for example, in, in the ACEs questionnaire, your parent getting divorced is scored a one and being raped is also scored a one. 
like what if your parents getting divorced was good for you <laughs> like what if your parents were terrible together and that they you know it's you can't quantify trauma okay so you can't score traumas together and then go oh this person has a five and therefore they need this response no that's not how that works so um the other thing that's wrong with aces and the questionnaire and the framework around it is that it doesn't actually encompass all the different forms of trauma it doesn't um talk about oppression it doesn't talk about racism it doesn't talk about poverty it doesn't talk about bullying and these are all different forms of trauma that you could be subjected to in childhood that could be impacting you but they're not even included within the framework at all because the theory and the framework is just shoddy it's just not been thought through um the other issue i have with it is that I am trauma informed and strength based. And what that means is that I believe that humans always have potential, always have strengths. And I would never want to label them or give them some sort of numerical value based on what somebody else chose to do to them. So the ACEs framework encourages us to quantify people's traumas based on what they were subjected to by other people. And so I don't think that's fair. I also think that it ignores the potential for growth because of it being such a deficit model. It's like, oh, this and this and this happened to that person. And that's why this and this and this might happen in their future or whatever. Um, and, you know, so for me, when I was doing the PhD, I also trained in advanced psychometrics. So um, I'm, I, and I've built psychometrics. And as a psychometrician, I can tell and I can see from the ACES framework that it is, doesn't work and that the scoring is invalid. Um, so now I see in, in practice that you have these professionals that are working with the ACES framework in a prescriptive way. They're doing the questionnaire with people and then they're telling them, oh, you score a six and therefore that's why this, this and this. So it creates these stereotypes of what people are and how they behave just because they've had this happen in their childhood. Um, it means that we don't look at people as, as having all this potential for growth in the future. So one of the things I tend to do if I'm like, at a conference and people are talking about aces and they'll say oh you know people with high aces they have this response and this response and they have this issue and this problem then um i tend to point them towards the work that suggests that people with high aces scores are more likely to end up on drugs in prison have lesser education and don't do very well in life however if you look at the research um statistically social workers 51 percent of social workers were abused in childhood and have severe childhood traumas so if you're in a conference room, you have 300, 400, 500 professionals um, and you say, OK, then, well, why don't we all do our ACES score now? Um, and we can then submit anonymously what our score was. And whenever I do that, it comes out between six and eight. So you have like an average of all those people in that room have an average ACES score of between six and eight. And yet they're all sat there and they all have degrees and they're all earning 35 grand a year and they're all holding caseloads and they're all functioning fucking humans. None of them are addicted to drugs or, or in prison. And I say to them, well, how has that worked then? Because you can't all be anomalies. You can't all be the outlier. You can't. It's impossible. How, how are you all in this room? How, how come there's so many of you? Um, so it's, it, it, just, it just doesn't add up. And then on top of that, um, there was an article published a couple of months ago from the original authors of ACES who have repeatedly asked us to stop using it. So that was, that was published in a top journal. It got through a full peer review. It's the original authors of ACES and they have asked very clearly for us to stop using it in practice, stop using it in psychology, stop using it at all around trauma because that's not what it was built for. And um, I've been sending people that article ever since it was released. It's extremely important that you listen to the original authors and how shit their data collection was and how shit their fucking associations were that they, that they found in their data analysis. Because what we've done is we've extrapolated their findings and then started using it as a predictive risk model. And that's not, that's not going to work. Um, it's not fair and it's stigmatizing. So everybody needs to read that article. We need to stop brushing under the carpet the fact that the original authors have asked us to stop using it because that's important. <laughs> Jessica, I love just how clearly you have articulated your, um, your concerns about that research. And I like that because there's lots of people here who've come today whose lives have been helped by ACEs. And what I want to do is to help us all to think more deeply. And so what you're talking about, Jess, is the way we, um, the way scientific 
um, research is constructed, the purpose for which it's constructed, the kinds of conversations that can be had and can't be had. As a, so for everybody who's joining us here today, Jess's um, description that she's just given there highlights the underlying things that often do not get talked about, which is how does knowledge get constructed? Let me come back to say, because lots of you have known, yet know that I have come to be seen as, um, I think some people would say promoting an ACES framework. I don't like that word promoting because what I think ACES does is help us to think more deeply about human behavior. But Jess, you've just told us how you, what you think some of the limitations of that are. Hearing that debate gives people an opportunity to think through themselves where they think limitations are, where they think a concept is helpful, and where it doesn't become so helpful. And I don't want those debates held just at an elite level. I want the wider public to be able to take part in them as well. I personally think that it's really interesting that ACES has helped us to have a, a cultural debate that attachment didn't help us to have that trauma hasn't helped us to have. So I think there's something really interesting in why ACES has been helpful to people to think in new ways that we haven't been able to talk about in 75 years since attachment work came along. And, you know, if, if we had two hours, we could go into some of the details of that debate. And I'm actually feeling really sorry that we don't. The key thing that I think this morning does that I hope it does anyway, is to help people to question how knowledge gets constructed and also how an original purpose, when it gets transferred to other contexts, loses some of the strengths that it has. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we need to do is we need curiosity, we need to question, and we need to find the tones that help us to have debates so that more people are included in that debate. And I'm hoping that that's what this morning has done. And I'm watching the chat roll in and it seems like it's done that. So if it has, I'll be delighted. I know we're almost needing to wind up, Gary. It's okay. Do you wanna? Yeah, the, the, the chat is, uh, is definitely going off the scale. Before we, before we, before we wrap up, uh, Jess, I'm keen to find out a little bit more about your, your new book, uh, Why Women Are Blamed for Everything, Exploring Victim Blaming uh, of Women Subject to uh, uh, Violence and Trauma. Um, it's obviously, it's out and available now. Uh, how has it been received? Um, I have, actually, I have a copy here for those of you that don't know what it looks like. It's a um okay how was it received well um gen like aside from people being mardy about it um it's it's been absolutely great like the reviews have been amazing um people have it's just changed for so many people people are reading it with their daughters with their sons they're having um conversations that you know they wouldn't normally sorry there's people saying they missed the book it's here sorry <laughs> um it's, it's a, sorry i was just watching the chat pop up on my phone i'm like it's here it's, you can just have this instead of my face for a little bit um so it's been really impactful for a lot of people it's changed the way people especially women and girls are like blaming themselves for male violence um it's was it's just been so much more successful than I ever thought possible. It sold ten thousand copies in the first like two months or so, um, and then it got picked up by a um, in, you know international publisher, and um, it's going to be translated into all different languages, and it's going all around the world, and it's being released on Kindle on the sixteenth of July. Um, it comes back out in hardback in August, and then it's going to be re-released in paperback with a foreword from someone I don't know who yet, and. Um, and then I'm, we're working at the moment on trying, uh, it's being republished in lots of different countries and in all different languages. It's just been so impactful, but like, yeah, it's, um, and then, oh yeah. And then like, it's coming out in audio book and they told, and like, I didn't, I thought it was going to be given to a posh person to narrate basically. <laughs> and then um, I was chatting to them about it and they were like, no, no, we want you to narrate the audio book because it's like your voice. And I was like, yes. So um, <laughs> that's going to be so that's going to be so weird because it's going to be like my voice narrating an audio book and shit. So like, that's going to be really interesting to listen to, but generally speaking, 
um, it, the feedback's been amazing. I just get emails from people all the time being like, it's completely changed the way that they look at violence towards women and, and self-blame and victim blaming. And they're using it in book clubs and in universities and it's being, and it's being put in public libraries. So people are going to their libraries and then like, like requesting copies of it to be put into libraries. And it's just, it's, it's been a bit, it's a bit overwhelming, really. I just, I remember I said to Jamie when I was ready like to put it out, cause I self published it, you see, um, it was peer reviewed because it's from the PhD and then I, and then I had it peer reviewed by two other people and then I put it out through my company. Um, and I was like saying to Jamie, I was like, Oh, if I sell like a few hundred copies, I'll be happy. Like I'd be like ecstatic. Um, and then it just went huge. Um, and now it's, yeah. So it was just, it's just, it's just amazing. I've just been, I think I've just been really, I'm just really happy with it. So yeah, I'm, I, I appreciate you having me on and chatting to me about it. <laughs> yes, I know that feeling as well because when we published our, this book, Tigers and Teddies, we decided for the first time ever to also have an audio version. And so mm. I went and recorded it in my voice and it's just come out in the last few weeks as well. And it's just so weird to sit and read your own writing in your own voice and think, did I, did I get the intonation of that right? And to tell the truth, I haven't listened to my audio version of the book because I'm not sure I can bear to, but if it's helpful to other people, then I'm glad that I've put it out there. But it does just become really interesting to think, how do you convey knowledge and, and now when you do it in your own voice, I, I just find it to be weird and you just have to roll with it. I trust when people are coming back, a bit like you're saying, you know, I trust when people are coming back saying that's helpful, I think, okay, well then I'll keep doing that. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> delighted to hear your experience of that too. <laughs> So Dr. Jess Taylor's book, Why Women Are Blamed for Everything, and Dr. Suzanne Zedike's book, Sabretooth Tigers uh, and Teddy Bears, The Connected Baby Guide to Attachment, both available on audio, Kindle and in print. Jessica, uh, Jess, using your Sunday name there, thank you so much for your yeah. time today. It has thank been you. more than insightful. Uh, I have to say, and it's been one of the quietest uh, involvement from me, if you like. <laughs> it's been absolutely fascinating. And I hope we get the opportunity to get you both back uh, to look at some of the other issues that have been raised within the vodcast, particularly, I think, around, there's a lot to be said around the ACES debate, which I think uh, would be would be extremely interesting to 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 have both you, Suzanne, and, and Jess in, uh, in, a, in another Saturday morning uh, hour or more. So thank you so much again. We're back uh, on the 25th of July when we'll, we'll be looking at uh, early years uh, after lockdown with Lullaby Lane Nursery in Glasgow. Uh, so uh, Dr. Suzanne Zedike, Dr. Jess Taylor, thank you very much. And thank you to you, wherever you are, for joining us this morning. Have a super weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thank you.